So I'm aware if you're here, there's a likelihood that you are considering becoming a professional practitioner or you already are a professional practitioner and you would like to move your business forward in some way, increase your income, maybe modify what you're doing to free up more of your time so you can create the lifestyle that you want. Um, and because I want to make this really useful for you, I can run with what I decided in my fantasy headspace might be useful for people. I can run with that. And what I've done is I, I've, got, I've got five points that were relevant to me on how I built a business head. I'm going to use these as the basis for the webinar. But I also want to invite people. Um, so Carlos is saying he cannot see me. I'm sorry, Carlos. I don't know what to say. I don't look that great anyway. Um, but what I will say is if you, if you want to ask me questions throughout this, please do ask because I'm happy to dive down what rabbit holes we need to in order to make sure there's some good stuff in here that's actually going to help you regardless of what you want to do going forward in the future. I will say up front that this webinar, this live webinar is sponsored by my 2020 Prosperous Practitioner Crucible, which is a six-month deep coaching group small group, uh, maximum eight people, which is all about basically moving your business forward. It's about focusing on creating income and prosperity, doing what you love to do or leveraging your expertise as a practitioner. I'm not going to say too much about that here because I want to get into the content of the webinar, but just know that that's something that's happening for the first six months of 2020 if you're looking to up your business game. Okay, so let us begin. Let me pull my rough framework up. Originally, I had seven points. I've consolidated them down into five. Ultimately, these things that I want to share with you, they come from my experience of building a business head, what I call building a business head for myself. Um, and obviously, this is a cake that I could have sliced into any number of pieces, but I've sliced them into five pieces. And I want to say that each one of these five pieces, this is not a five-step thing. First, I did this, then I did that, then I did that. These are things that run concurrently and are still running concurrently because I too am always looking to evolve how I operate in terms of my uh, professional life, which given that I am a, an independent wealth creator is intimately linked with my personal life. So just to be aware that these five points, these are almost arbitrary slicings in a great many ways, but they are points through which we can enter some interesting material. So five points, how did I build a business head? Hopefully you already watched the video where I talked about how when I was younger, I used to absolutely believe that I did not have a head for business. So my first point on this list was to let go of old stories and upgrade reality. Now, if you're familiar with my work, you'll know that I am very, very interested in reality tunnels. The truth of the matter is some reality tun tunnels are highly functional highly adaptive for uh, creating income flow, creating what you want within the economic conditions and systems that we find ourselves within. The economy, money, all of this kind of stuff, it is basically a game. The whole thing is a game. Economy doesn't really exist. It's a hugely complex, socially constructed game. This is why you get like on stock markets and things, derivatives are being tr traded that just don't make any sense. They don't meet needs in the world. We have such a, a level of complexity and abstraction in our money systems, in our economy. The whole thing is a, an artifice, but it's a profoundly powerful one because it organizes labor and it organizes productivity and it organizes wealth flow. So there's a whole game. And do you know what? Most of us, I believe, or if anyone has a background, anything like mine, most of us are not really raised with any understanding of that game or any craft in really engaging with that game with any kind of efficacy. And we often are um, raised to believe certain things about how it works, which just are not the case, raised to hold certain values around it, which keep us constrained in our actions. And we also often have it tied into our sense of capability and capacity in our society. People are often measured by their 
their material success. Uh, so it kind of ends up being wired in at a personal level as well. So our personal stories about capability and what's possible for us play in as well. So I had this idea that I didn't have a head for business. And as I had a, an idea that business was something I didn't want to have anything to do with, uh, I had a lot of other ideas about money that were kind of dysfunctional as well. I had ideas that money was some sort of aggregate that you either had or you didn't, you had to accrue, you had to get it. And when you took it, somebody else lost it. It was a sort of zero sum game mentality. I also bought the line as I was growing up that money was earned, that money was some kind of reward you get, some scraps that you get thrown from the table of the master for doing a good enough job, for jumping the right hoops in the right way, for being useful, that you earned money. Now, <clears throat> of course, a lot of people do earn money, but that whole earning money myth is an idea to keep people uh, being cogs in somebody else's money machine. OK, so that's a thing to be aware of. A lot of people are raised inside of the model of employment, earning money, this kind of thing. And they don't see that wealth, the money for a start is an artificially created thing. There are certain people who are in charge of how much there is in the supply, who get to leverage it up, who actually get to create it from thin air. And there are other people who are sold the idea that you have to work hard for it. Right. So who's running the game? Certainly not those who are sold the idea that they have to work hard for it. And whilst very few of us are gonna get the opportunity to become money creators, once we understand how it works, we can step into creator mode and start becoming wealth creators rather than wage slaves or people that earn a living. So it's really important to rebuild your frames around economy, how it works, this kind of thing. This was a huge thing um, that I did that was part of my uh, building a business head. Now, if that seems abstract, it's not. It really isn't. The psychology of employment is entirely different from the psychology of business and wealth creation. Entirely different psychology, entirely different way of seeing the world and engaging with the world. And if you were not taught any of that, if you were not raised in that environment, it's going to be challenging for you to uh, operate in a business function, a true business function. And this is something that comes up a lot when people transition initially from being employed by others to self-employed. They often carry a lot of the same mindsets with them. It's just that now they're their own boss. They're still employed. They still have this idea of time for money, of sacrificial work, of these sorts of things, of value coming from that. Uh, and it often holds people down from really releasing their potential to generate the kind of income that they would like, um, doing only stuff that is their talent time stuff and getting them out of gray zone, sacrificial work and this kind of thing. So that was a, a huge thing for me. It's literally upgrading your reality. So I have done this and I am doing this still. Let me just tell you a quick story. <clears throat> when I was doing my NLP trainer training many years ago, John Laval was filling in for Paul McKenna because Paul McKenna uh, was actually, they said he was ill, but I discovered afterwards that he was over in the States signing a TV show deal. It was a big, uh, big payment for him, big payout for him that was. The TV show didn't take off. It did get made, but it didn't take off. So Paul wasn't there and John LaValle had to fill in. And this meant that John ended up telling a lot of stories and, and sharing hints and tips. And John has an interesting business. He's a guy who has an interesting business. So he shared a lot of frames around business. And there was one thing that he shared that has stayed with me for a long time. And it struck me as the time, I couldn't make sense of it at the time. John pointed out that if you live in a small to average town in Europe or the States or anywhere in the Western world, quote unquote. The likelihood is that that town has a stronger, a more vibrant economy than some entire nations in the developing world. Now, I don't know if that is actually true, 
But if we just kind of take it as a pointer, the fact is, comparatively speaking, if you live in the Western world, if you live in Europe or you live in the United States or you live in Australia or you live in New Zealand or, you know, um, anywhere in the developed world, yeah, you live in a small town, it's got a pretty vibrant economy, even compared to some nations in the developing world. So John pointed this out. He said that money was flowing past you if you lived in the Western world. It was flowing past you. And all you really had to do was recognize this and then drop in a tube and siphon some of it off. Now, I thought this was a really interesting idea. For a start, it was the first time I'd been introduced to the fluid model of money. For me, money was always a thing. You either had it or you didn't. It was a substance that you had. It didn't flow in my world. It had to be worked hard in order to be got and then retained and saved and all of these things. So it was the first time I really got introduced to this fluid dynamics model, which is actually, you look at people who understand money, they always have fluid metaphors about money. Uh, and not really blocky metaphors that people who are less good with money tend to hold. So that was, that was one element to it. But there was this other point that John was talking about putting this, this tube in and siphoning some of it off. And my question was, well, how do you do that, John? Because it didn't make any sense to me. It didn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, so... But it, it stuck with me. There must be some way of doing this. There's got to be a way that, that this actually realizes somehow. How do I do this? And I had to really reorganize a lot about my understanding around money and economy and all of this, as I said, to, to begin to be able to do it, to understand how to create value exchanges. Because money is not wealth. Okay, money is not wealth. Money is a means by which wealth can be exchanged and moved. Money is actually a mechanism for redistributing wealth. It works in and of itself to redistribute wealth from those who work for it. And their wealth is their energy and their labor. It gets converted into a money form, which then gets moved to other people, you get to benefit from it. So those who own the money system, it's a wealth extraction system. But those who understand how it works get to use it more dynamically so as they're not enslaved by it and they're able to use it to generate and create wealth for themselves in their own world and other kinds of wealth for people. So you get value exchanges. So one of the big things that I had to learn about in terms of providing business services, we're starting to really have a multi-dimensional understanding of what value is and how to create value exchanges that were mutually beneficial and were therefore generative, created a win-win. I have no interest, by the way, I'll just say this, my own values are in the mix here. I have no interest as an independent wealth flow creator. I have no interest in playing a zero-sum game where I win and someone else loses. I want to find engines of value exchange to create value for people out there who I'm engaging with, whilst at the same time, bring money in to me and other forms of value as well in terms of personal reward and this kind of thing. So these are some of the elements around rebuilding one's psychology. And that job is going to be different for different people. I know the path that I've walked in rebuilding my own personal psychology, my own worldview, are the stories I've had to let go of, the new understandings I've had to connect with, the new ways of seeing the world, the new ways of being in the world. I know the journey that I've walked myself and continue to walk. And I'm going to give you some, some input with some of the other points on how, how to um, catalyze this. Um, but how you ultimately do it is going to depend on what your current worldviews and personal psychology set is about. And... Uh, what needs to be adjusted for you. And I will say this is one of the reasons why personal input, personal coaching is an incredibly valuable thing. If you've got somebody who can point out to you, who can spotlight the sense making that you're doing and highlight how that might be functioning or not functioning so well uh, for you, this is a, a very useful thing to be able to get personal coaching on this front. Um, it tends to speed the game up, but we'll, we'll talk about that somewhere else. Okay, so that's the first point is I put here letting go of old stories and upgrading reality. 
I want to also say that part of this is point number two that I have on the list, a recline a bit here. Point number two I have on the list, which was um, to do with seeing more deeply. To do with seeing more deeply. There is something that an old mentor of mine used to call the pathway to poverty. And in relation to, to people like hypnotherapists or coaches or um, consultants of, of other kinds, the pathway to poverty generally includes getting some qualifications that say that you can do it and then setting up a website that says you are a professional in that area and getting some business cards printed that say who you are and how you can be contacted. And the reason it generally goes nowhere. This is kind of redundant stuff in a great many ways, or at least it only becomes significant when there are some other understandings in place. But it is the thing that most people do. They follow this pathway to poverty. Um, so part of that is generally speaking, somebody who qualifies a hypnotherapist, they will look at other people's hypnotherapy websites and they will go, well, what does this person doing? What are they saying? And then they create a similar website. Maybe they looked at a few different examples that seems to offer the same sorts of things. And, and the problem comes from not looking deep enough. This is a problem of looking at the surface structure of somebody else's business and attempting to emulate that surface structure as if it is the surface structure that is doing the job. And it isn't. It never is. There are deep structure elements that are really doing the job. If the person that you are even modeling, because a lot of the time people copy the surface structure of businesses that exist, that are out there trying to give the impression of being successful, they may not even be successful businesses. They may not be good models to copy. Even if somebody is successful um, in doing what they do, it doesn't mean that copying their surface level stuff is going to work. One example I often give, um, I almost always say this when I'm doing coaching or mentoring for anybody who is looking to do something like me, to be a change work practitioner or a coach or something like this. I always give a caveat up front. I say, do not look at my website, especially my jamestrip.co.uk website. Do not look at that website as being any kind of exemplar of how to get business and convert clients, right? Convert prospects into clients, so to speak. Do not look at it as an example. It is largely junk. I get business, I get clients in spite of that website, not because of it, okay? And I get those clients because of other things I'm doing in the world, ways that I am generatively engaging. I could probably take the website away and just replace it with a page saying, Hey, this is James Tripp's site. If you want to message me, go here. Okay, I've got a little bit more information on it than that, but it's not a good example. So even though somebody might say, well, James is doing all right, so I'm going to copy what he's doing on the surface. What I'm doing on the surface isn't really the mechanisms that are making things work for me. So I didn't get this at first. I didn't understand this. I did this pathway to poverty thing. And as I say, an old mentor of mine pointed it out. said, here's the pathway to poverty. And as he rattled it off to me, I thought, well, yes, I'm doing that. Yep, I've done that. I've done that. So that was a person that helped me to begin to see deeper. So one of the things, one of the frames I often share is in order to be successful or prosperous as a practitioner, you need to develop two games. There is your core game is your practitioner skills. This is the stuff, if you're a consultant, it's your consulting skills and your knowledge from which you consult. If you're a hypnotherapist, it's your hypnosis skills and your therapy skills. If you're a coach, it's your abilities to ask questions, nudge people in useful directions and see things that your client is unable to see. These are all, you know, there's many, many more aspects to a core game. Somebody can have an exquisite core game really good at what they do. Let's say there are issue-specific change worker. They really get change happening with people. But without a well-developed extended game, they won't really go anywhere. 
okay? Or without the right kind of extended game. Now, the extended game is your business game. It's your business head. It's how you engage. It's how you connect what you're able to do and your capacities with the world around you so that people can appreciate the value that there is and they want to engage in a value exchange with you. So this extended game, this is a game that is every bit as vibrant and rich as your core game. Now, most people, they get really into their core game. That's the thing that they love. And they go, you know, I don't really want to do that business stuff. Or, you know, if I just, if I just get really good, I build it and they will come is the old story. And for some people, that does actually work that way. Um, but it's usually because they've got something in their personal psychology that's already working for them that has them stride forward and automatically connect what they're doing to the world. Other people, unfortunately, like myself, how I was, I used to hang back a lot. So I, I not only didn't have a well-developed extended game, I had other patterns in place that were, that were keeping me from really connecting what I had to offer with the world. So I had to do a lot of repatterning, which is what we discussed in point one. So it's looking deeper, it's understanding that however something looks on the surface, it's how it's put together underneath the surface that really counts. This is like, why is somebody doing something this way? What else have they got going on? What are the bits that really work versus the bits that don't really work? You wanna be able to look deeper because ultimately you're gonna to have to put together a business machine, so to speak, that's gonna work for you. Okay, this is a big distinction, by the way, between people that really understand how to create wealth flow is they create things that work for them rather than always working for money. Okay, so if you look beneath the surface of people who are successful at doing what they're doing, what they've got is they've got a lot of stuff in place that's working for them. Some of that is um, to do with infrastructure, these sorts of things. Some of it's to do with content they've created in the world. Some of it is to do with patterns of engagement that work for them. But it's finding and building the stuff that works for you so you don't have to be working for money all the time. So this is a, an important thing, seeing deeper, recognizing there is depth to this. Don't just try and facsimile the surface structure of someone's business be willing to look deep. Okay, so um, the next point on my list is, uh, this is, oh, look, look, there we go. Am I doing this the right way? Yeah, I am. If you have questions, please do ask them. This is a really interesting thing. When I do a webinar on um, hypnosis or NLP stuff or anything like that, self-development stuff, I get a ton of questions come in. But it's really interesting to me that this one, there aren't so many questions coming in. There's a good number of people. There's, there's 50 people on the Zoom link here. I don't know how many people are on the Facebook live stream. By the way, if you're on Facebook, you're watching this on Facebook, I am not monitoring the, inc the uh, comments on Facebook. Um, I cannot multitask like that, but I will mop them up afterwards. If you do have any questions and you ask them on Facebook, I will reply to them either on there or maybe make some additional audios or videos. Um, but if you do have questions, coming up um so matt's asked useful auto suggestions for point one it's not that simple matt this is a, a rich thing it's not just a matter of auto suggestions it's a matter of understanding structures so i can't give you useful auto suggestions because auto suggestions in and of themselves aren't necessarily going to do that much also it's going to depend upon the individual of course you could create auto suggestions if you understood the specific mind shifts an individual needed to make but to give generic auto suggestions, I think would definitely be um, giving an unuseful message for people. Uh, there is more richness to it than, than just some sort of turnkey set of auto suggestions. There really is, this is understanding a game. Um, book recommendations, wow. That's one I'm gonna come back to. I'm gonna come back to book recommendations because I've read a lot of books and that actually relates to one of the points that I have here on the list. So. Thank you. So Eric's saying, just provide one example. Just provide one example of what, Eric? Um, if you can tell me what you'd like me to provide an example of, I will do my best to provide an example of it. Uh, William is saying, will you talk about sales copy or um, websites? I'm not gonna talk about sales copy here because this is, that's, that's a chunked down element. 
okay? If you look at developing a business head, a business game, if you look at developing a business game, here's an interesting thing, by the way, talking of books, I read a lot of autobiographies by entrepreneurs because I wanted to get how they thought about stuff. And when I started out um, looking at entrepreneurs, I assumed that there was a sort of core set of skills that entrepreneurs had, core set of skills. And all entrepreneurs, to be successful entrepreneurs, would have this core set of skills. It turns out that's not the case. And it's actually a bit like movie directors. If you look at movie directors, you would think that movie directing was a particular job that had a particular job description, therefore a core set of skills. It isn't. A movie director is just somebody who is tasked with the hands-on making of the movie. So some really understand camera work and they get in and they set up shots. Others have no idea. They focus on the performance of the actors. Whatever a movie director does, they will do what they're strong at and they will outsource the other bits that they're less good at to other people. So they work with a team and they are more like the generalist who pulls it together, who works with a team of specialists. So this is this tends to be how these things sort of work now. Ultimately, when you're running a business, you're gonna develop certain specialisms for yourself. Like somebody was saying to me just a day or so ago, you know, oh, I don't really have a head for business. I'm aware that I need to be able to build websites or something like this. It's like, no, you don't need to be able to build websites. That's not about having a head for business. You need to be able to get websites built, but that's not the same as needing to be able to build websites. Now, sales copy, this is an interesting thing. One of the major frames that I have around what I do is the conversation you're having with the world. I prefer this term over marketing. I prefer the term over marketing. It works better for me in a self-hypnosis sense. So I think of the conversation I'm having with the world. One thing that I keep in my core game, in my extended game, my business game, is being in charge of my communications, which you could call sales and copywriting. I do not outsource this. I know people that do, but I do not. Because when I look at myself as a practitioner, my communication skills is part of my talent time stuff, not my gray zone stuff. So I like to keep my hand really strongly on that lever. For that reason, I have a lot of um, perspective on writing effective copy. And because I often write from my heart, sometimes I do it, sometimes I do it more strategically, sometimes I do it more from my heart recruiting that strategy stuff. So I do have quite a lot of perspective on that, but I don't want to go down that because it's a real specialism. It's a real kind of specialism in and of itself. It happens to be one that I like to engage with, uh, but you know, it's to go down that would be the same as me going down into how to build websites or how to uh, run your books or how to hire the right kind of accountant in order for you to grow effectively or uh, how to engage and work with teams or how to, it's, it's a little bit too specialist for this webinar. Um, and that would be like a whole program in and of itself. However, uh, obviously with the six month immersion, that is an area that there is an opportunity to get more deeply into. Um, I'm just going to back up here because the, the comments have moved on a bit more quickly than I would hope. Um, so an example of how one changes mindset to wealth creation rather than work for money. I don't know, Eric, if you did the recent program, Reality Shaper Deep Craft, um, but that's full of tools and techniques for shifting mindset, as is self-hypnosis and personal alchemy. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of examples of, of my ways of working with self-transformation um, and I've done a lot of stuff on that recently. So if you're looking for specific tools for moving your mind, there's a whole lot there. What I'm more interested in here, I've given you some examples of some of the mind shifts that are useful to make, i.e. from even that in itself, okay? Working for money, earning money. Listen to it. What's it like to earn money? What does that mean to you? How is it to be a creator of wealth? even just immersing in those two terms. When you check them out, you check out the felt sense of them. How is that different? How would it be if you were a wealth creator? 
who thinks in terms of wealth creation? How can you take that on board? So I, I'm not going to give, I'm not going to get into examples of tools because I've done a whole, the last two programs I've put out have been about these tools. And this is about something a little bit different here. So um, I would invite you to check those out, Eric. So um, Richard's asked, what apart from paid advertising would be the most important piece of the extended game to have in place to build a local hypno practice. See, that's an interesting thing, Richard. In January, I'm probably going to do the first bit of paid advertising I've ever done. Okay. So I'm not, I think paid advertising is a fantastic thing. I think there are some great opportunities uh, with Google ads and Facebook ads. And from the research that I've been doing, they work differently for different sorts of things. For some things, Google is better, for some things, Facebook is better. But I have created a good income for myself and my family without paying a penny on advertising. Without paying a penny on advertising. When I started out, right at the very beginning, when I set myself up as a hypnotherapist, I didn't pay for any advertising. Oh, I might have put one advert in the paper, but it cost a lot of money and didn't yield any results. Uh, I did put the word out through other means. So I, I had a job at the time and I used the intranet message board to put the word out originally to say that I did this kind of work and I was you know, happy to work with people. Um, and I initially worked free of charge, which people say not to do. I worked free of charge because I was working for the stories, the feedback, and I was working for the reputation that it built. No paid ads, didn't do any paid ads. Um, I did do a lot of speaking at places. I got myself in speaking locally. So when I was a local hypnotherapist, uh, I would speak at the sort of local women's institute meetings, uh, any club that looked for speakers. I would offer my services as a speaker and I worked on my speaking game. I did a year and a half Toastmasters videoing myself, upping my speaking game, did a lot of work on that. So apart from paid advertising, there's what's called... Um, organic traffic generation, which you can work in, in the flesh because I wasn't an online guy at the time. That was a later phase for me. Uh, and it becomes about becoming adept at communicating the value you have to offer. So I did a lot of that and I really worked on that. So that question before about um, where I was saying different people's extended game is going to comprise different components. I did a lot of work on my communication for the purpose of being able to connect people with what I had to offer. And I took as many opportunities as possible to speak. So there's one um, example, really good for building a local hypnosis practice. Um, the, the thing is, is to do as much stuff as possible. If you're really keen to do hypnosis, you can even go around, go to places where there are, uh, go to places like coffee shops where people have a lot of customers come in or places like, um, barbers or hairdressers, these sorts of things, and let them know what you do when you're getting your hair cut, let them know what you do. Offer them a free session. If you're a hypnotist, offer them a free relaxation session. You see, the thing is, you go around to uh, local hairdressers, you offer the manager a free relaxation session, they'll be absolutely blown away by it, they'll love it. They talk to their customers all the time, they're gonna talk about it. You can even ask if you can leave cards in their place offering a discount to people coming in and you do a deal and you say for everybody you refer, I'll give you, I don't know, 15 pounds or whatever it would be, $15. You know, so you give them an experience, you give them an incentive to refer. They have customers, they have clients coming in all the time. That's a very good way to hit the ground running just as a small piece of chunk down advice. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of ideas that are part of, you know, that are available in the mix. In the mix. Um, Matt has written risk blindness. I should cogitate on, on what that's referring to. Um, I'm not sure. Risk blindness is a very interesting loaded term. Uh, maybe it's the opposite of risk aversion. There's always risk assessment to be done. One of the things that I was, was too risk averse, I believe. So part of rebuilding myself was building in a, um, a perception that I could handle a lot of stuff and that I had the capacity to make things work. Otherwise, I was going to be too fearful and lay low too much. 
So my problem wasn't risk blindness. The worldview I was coming from was risk aversion. You may get somebody else whose personal psychology is, um, does have too much risk blindness in it, in which case you need to make a different adjustment in your personal psychology. So I don't know if that's the question you're ask, asking there, Matt, but it was uh, a comment and it stimulated that thought. So uh, Eric is saying, is it some knowledge, gnosis or some skill? If a skill, please give one example. There's tons of skills, tons of skills. And constantly, here's the thing. You want to, when you're developing, let me just pick this because I'm, um, okay, look. Here's my next point on my list. I'm gonna tie this in with what you're asking here. So point three on here is engage, right? What I mean here is there's only one success strategy that actually works, and it is this. Get in the game, stay in the game, learn, grow, and adapt. I am very fortunate to know people all around the world who have made a success as practitioners, speakers, coaches, trainers, therapists, who are successful practitioners consultants of one kind or another. And if you actually look, if you go deep and start to look deep into the structure of their business, because I always ask people about this stuff because I have an interest. I want to be looking for more stuff I can utilize to up my own game. The one thing that I have found is no two people do it the same. Everybody builds their own business game. The only thing that anybody has in common is they get in the game, they stay in the game, they learn, they grow and adapt. Now, an important part of this is, is switching on your evaluatory systems and your feedback systems so that you're constantly looking, right, where am I at? Where do I want to get to? What am I doing to keep things out? What do I lack? And you want to constantly be, constantly be identifying what I call your developmental edge. Constantly be identifying your developmental edge. A lot of this stuff is skills-based stuff. Some of this stuff is mindset-based stuff. I'm gonna put a video out very soon because I've been editing up some old footage of me. And one thing that you can notice is how different my voice is. My voice is different because I chose to change my voice. It was part of me transforming myself as a communicator. So my communication skills at one point were part of my developmental edge. Now, a more recent developmental edge for me in terms of business and running a business um, that I want to run is looking to start to work generatively with teams rather than as a solo player. So part of my old personal psychology, my old way of being in the world was I'll do it all myself. I wasn't good at working with, I wasn't good at communicating my vision, uh, uh, managing people and stuff like that. It wasn't a an area that was natural to me. It was one that when I was employed, I avoided promotions because I really did hate having to run teams, okay? Now, that was a problem for me, hating having to run teams. I could have stayed in the place of, you know what? I'm no good at running teams. Or I could say, okay, so my team running game, that needs to be improved. So I've done a lot of work over the last two years to improve my capacity to work with other human beings, to put teams together and run teams. This has involved identifying developmental edges. Where am I good at doing certain things? What am I not good at doing? What do I tend to avoid? What do I tend to lean into? What needs adjusting? So to me, that's not just mindset, that's skill. I've had to have a lot of conversations. And one thing I tend to do now is I have a lot more conversations with prospective collaborators than I perhaps used to because Part of my business game is to develop my capacity to have those conversations in powerful, effective ways. And to get to that point, I had to be willing to have the conversations in, in, in um, awkward, clunky, difficult ways. So that is a conversation, having those conversations, generative conversations, that's a skill set. That's a skill set. Um, you know, so really, ultimately, you're going to identify what do you need to develop. One of the major pieces that I needed to change in my story set was that people were innately talented at some things and were going to be a dead loss at others. And there wasn't much you could do about that. I had to transform my understanding and start recognizing that any skill 
that I want to build, I can significantly up my game with. Any attitude I want to create, I can create, I can shape, I can significantly up my, up my game. So the question is identifying the bits you need. What is it that's missing for you? And again, this is why coaching and interactive format is such a powerful thing because it helps people identify, what do I need here? What do I need here? The things we need are sometimes not the things we think we need. Oh, here's another game I really had to transform is how do I work with productivity? How do I fire up my inspiration? How do I come from a place of creativity rather than organizing things in terms of drudgery and tasks? So my whole time and task management game, I spent a considerable amount of time rebuilding that. That is a mindset, an attitude shift, but it's a skill set as well. Knowing what to do in terms of behavior, and that sometimes includes internal behavior. So this is going to be different for different people, absolutely for sure. Everybody's got their own strengths and weaknesses, which means they're going to have different developmental edges. I had to put quite a lot of work into my speaking skills. Other people, they may find that a natural game for them. Uh, other people might want to work on writing skills, on management skills, on sales skills, copywriting skills, any kind of thing. It's going to depend on where you're at and what you want to create in terms of yourself. Okay, so um, Eric is asking, you just mentioned talent time versus gray zone stuff. Can you provide a very quick description of what you mean? Hell yes, I can provide a quick description of what I mean. Um, Talent time, this, this phrase, by the way, is not my phrase, talent time versus gray zone. It's from somebody else who was a mentor of mine. I'm not a big fan of the talent frame, but talent time, okay, let's just assume that talent isn't innate and it's something you can develop. Talent time is anything that you're doing in your business that you love doing, that you're good at doing, um, and therefore it just flows. So if you love it and you're good at doing it, it's going to flow. Then you've got gray zone stuff. And gray zone stuff is generally stuff that people go, well, you know, I don't really like doing that. I'm not that good at it. Or maybe I am good at it, but I don't like doing it. And for that reason, it's not going to flow. You're always going to have to kind of tr push yourself through it and grind through it. Now, the more gray zone activity that you have in your workflow, the slower you will move the more you will procrastinate and the more you will hang back and ultimately the less income you're going to create. Even if you're absolutely convinced that that stuff needs to be done and needs to be done by you. But the talent time stuff, um, that stuff's going to be easy. It's going to flow. Now, I can give you a perfect example of this. If you watch my YouTube videos, you will notice about six or seven months ago, I upped my editing game. I made an attempt to up my editing game based on some information that I'd received about YouTube videos and uh, attention and retention of viewership and these kinds of things. So I put in a lot more cuts into the videos and changes in frame size where I'm zooming in, zooming out, put a little sequence on the front end, put more slides, more funky elements in because it's just tricking the brain and keeping it engaged. This works well for YouTube, it works well with the YouTube rankings, or sorts of things like this. Now, I'm reasonably good at doing it. I know how to edit, I've got an instinct for it, I've got an intuition for it, but it is very time consuming, and it drains the blood from my brain and the life from my soul. I find it ultimately soul crushing. Now, I've been YouTubing for a long time. I used to rock up and deliver, there we go, boom. And I get the thing recorded and up in an hour. And it got to the point with some of the newer things, even the intro sections or the bits and pieces, people don't see the detail in it. It was taking me a whole day to get a video up, whereas it was taking me an hour before. This was gray zone stuff for me. It's not that it wasn't worth doing and it wasn't that I wasn't good at doing it, but it was taking me away from doing things which I am you know, naturally good with. So I'm much better off spending that time getting inspired so I can just deliver the message rather than delivering a message and then grinding through all day. So ultimately, like if you take today, for example, I have made, let me just see, I've made three videos. Um, I've done two workouts. I'm going to do another workout. And I have prepped this webinar. I'm delivering this webinar. 
And I've actually got quite a lot done because I've stayed in my talent time. I could have spent all day just making one of those three videos by getting too hung up in gray zone stuff. Now, if I consider that it really is important to do that gray zone stuff, if I wanna really work effectively in my life, I need to find somebody else to do it. And this is where working with teams becomes an important thing as well. So that's an example of talent time versus gray zone. I've built websites in the past. I can build websites. I used to build websites and do this gray zone stuff because at the time I was like, well, I don't really wanna spend the money when I know that I can do it myself. But recognizing that by letting someone else build the website, that frees my time to go into talent time stuff. I will end up making more money and able to pay the, the person that built the website than I would have done building it myself. So starting to recognize where you're, the stuff you love doing, the stuff that you're good at doing, which you're always gonna flow with, it's gonna be the high yield activities for you, the gray zone stuff, learn to get other people to do it. I'm still developing that. That's still part of my developmental edge of letting go of gray zone stuff. And I've been working with that one for many, many years. Um, so Eric says, thank you. The personal alchemy product does appeal to me. It has very good feedback from a great number of people. It is probably the best selling thing that I have ever done. So maybe you'll want to check that out, Eric. I'm not here to sell anything. So please do if you wish to. Um, so, uh, Luciano Lemes, forgive me if I'm saying your name wrong, says, I would suggest a book from T. Harv Ecker, The Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. I'm, there's a huge number of great books out there. Um, I can't vouch for that one, but it might be fantastic. Um, so, uh, Guilemi is saying, so you're encouraging doing lecture. Yeah, speaking, I, I can only speak for myself, but speaking has been a huge thing for me. Here I am speaking now. Um, yes, because communicating is massively important. Here's the thing. Whatever it is that you're doing, you need to be able to connect that into the world. So there's a frame I use, which is the conversation you are having with the world about what it is that you do. Most people do this conversation really badly. They think that it's about, they, they do it all tell and no show. So they're always trying to persuade people and sell people themselves and give people their resume and all of this kind of thing and say, I've got this experience and I've got that. I don't think that's a strong way to do it. You've got to have a conversation with the world, right? Now, <clears throat> conversation, I mean, metaphorically, you've got to communicate somehow. You've got to speak, you've got to write, probably speak or write, ultimately it's gonna be speak or write, okay? And then it's like, what kind of difference do you wanna make with this conversation? Ultimately, if you're a practitioner, you're a difference maker. And what a lot of people do is they go, well, you know, I make a difference in this small context, so I've gotta sell people on why it's worth them coming over here and have me make differences with them. No, that isn't gonna work. Reach out to the world and make differences. So, when I put YouTube videos out, most of the time, my aim with each video is to share something that can potentially make a difference to somebody. And a lot of people who have a difference made to them through those videos will ultimately end up working with me in some way because they've decided, actually, that really helped me out, that perspective. I think James can see some things that it will be useful to help me, you know, that for me to see as well, whatever it might be. The point is, is you've got to be able to reach out into the world and make a difference. And you do this through communication. So yes, speak, connect, have the conversation with the world. Jimi Hendrix was a game-changing guitar player. Now, Jimi Hendrix used to play in pickup bands in New York City. He used to get fired because he was too out there. Jimi could have scuttled off and stayed playing guitar in his bedroom. But he needed to connect his guitar playing with the world, which meant he needed to get out there and engage with the world. This is absolutely fundamental as a practitioner is to get out there and engage with the world. Your means of doing this is going to be your means. Some people are much more writing orientated. My friend William Whitecloud writes some fantastic stuff and it works incredibly well for him. Uh, I'm more of a speaker. You'll note that I do not have a plethora of books because I worked on my speaking-based communication rather than my written-based communication. In fact, some people may have noticed that my written-based communication is full of appalling typos and grammatical bungles. 
uh, and that's because I haven't really lent into making that a craft. So yes, uh, I wouldn't say lectures necessarily, but have conversations, communicate, have a conversation with the world. Um, yeah, Matt says, walk around handing out business cards to smokers. You can always try that, see how it works. I don't know how that works. I've not done it. Um, Matt Beach, in relation to entrepreneurial skills, I think this ties back to something earlier. Um, I'm not sure there's a lot of things in the chat, so I can't see what that ties back to, what the in, in relation to is. So uh, Lisa Hancock says, that's an awesome idea with hairdressers. It is actually, <laughs> Lisa, it really does work. They are people who have a client base themselves. They talk to their clients. Uh, they have a relationship with their clients. They're often, the thing about hairdressers is they're often, um, I don't know whether you're UK based or not, but they, they often serve as agony aunts. Sometimes their clients will pour out their, their woes and their troubles. So if they know somebody and they've got direct experience of somebody who can help them make changes in their lives, it just kind of marries and, and knits together very well. So it's, it's, it's a very chunked down specific strategy, but I know a lot of people that have made that work beautifully. So if it's an idea that appeals to you, I would suggest um, running with that and exploring with it. Richard, hey, how are you doing? So Richard Dougal's on here, he's saying, um, how do we use pain away from in marketing or sales call to bring in clients? So this is an interesting thing, pain. Uh, the video I put out, last night um, around the question of should I market myself as a hypnotherapist or as a coach? Um, one of the major things with this, should I market as a hypnotherapist or coach is they connect to different markets. Now, some people are interested in something from a place of what you might call a rational passion. So for example, I'm a hypnosis trainer amongst other things. Mostly, People that want to learn hypnosis, it's not about their pain. There's no pain there for people, really. I mean, maybe if you dug deep enough, you could find pain, but you don't really need to because these people are already on a path of irrational passion. There is something they want, they want to master it, they want to get it. So if you can help people, if you can key into that, starting to crank the pain levers when there's a lot of irrational passion in place isn't necessarily um, the most useful thing to do. Also on the flip side of that, you've got therapy-based stuff. Now therapy-based stuff is more, there's more pain in this, okay? So people are coming from a place of desperation rather than inspiration and you don't really need to crank the pain all that hard. Um, you can uh, you can just speak to the pain that's already there, you know. So there's desperation in place. One of the things about digging for pain is often when you are trying to sell something to somebody that at the moment they've got no need for, they've got no self-perceived need for. Now I will say up front that I don't really pursue that. So I don't try and sell hypnosis training to people who up until now have got no interest in hypnosis. If I wanted to, I might wanna use the pain levers at that point and say, you know, is your life falling apart because da -da 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 -da. hypnosis is the solution. But I'm already connecting to people who have decided that's the solution already. So I don't really need to create a need. So pain levers tend to get used to create a need that isn't already there. The alternative to that is to do what I prefer to do, which is identify needs that are there and come out and meet them. That way, you don't really need to use that pain stuff or artificially crank it up because it's already going to be in the matrix on the therapy side of things, or there's going to be a rational passion taking care of it on the other side of things. I would also say that personally for me, if I find somebody artificially cranking pain levers, hmm, I'm walking. I'm out of there. I hate that cheap level manipulation. I'm not saying it doesn't work, but I hate it. I remember seeing somebody, uh, a friend of mine, who was working with a business part at the time. He delivered a free workshop, a couple of hours in the evening, and then he had a, a sale off the back end of it. And he did such a great workshop and he stacked so much value into the offer that I was like, do you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to follow. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this program that's being offered at the end. 
And then his business partner walked on stage and he said, and I just want you to know, if you can't see the value in this and you're not ready to go for this, basically, you don't have what it takes. You're never going to make it in business. You can't even make a simple decision like this. You, you're not going to make it in business. And it was such a cheap, pain-based maneuver trying to build insecurity and build lack. And it was so low brow manipulation that unfortunately, the great work that my friend had done got blown away, got blown out from this cheap level, artificial pain-based manipulation. So for me, mm, I'm not a raging fan of cranking those pain levers. Either there's pain there, in which case you can speak to it. You don't have to start to artificially mine it too much. Um, or just a rational passion there. And that is phenomenally powerful in and of itself. Uh, so um, from James, have you, how have you developed your content creation approaches? Um, I had to do a lot of stuff to hack that because really, again, content creation for me, if I get mired down in the gray zone stuff, I'm screwed. I'm never going to create the content. So I have to find ways of leveraging my talent time stuff. So one of the things I've done a great deal of across many years is I will put on a workshop because I know when I'm in a room having a conversation with real life people, that's my talent time stuff. If I capture that, that's great. I can create content out of that. If I sit down separated and, and sit there and plan strategically what needs to happen in what order and sequence, ooh, it's death for me. It's drudgery. So I find that really, really difficult. I'm not saying that the way I create content is the best way to create content, but I'm always finding the best way for me so that I can bring my spark, my enthusiasm, what I uniquely bring to it and have that channel through um, fluidly and effortlessly. So I'm always working on that. And I'm actually working at the moment on delivering some content in a very different way. And that has had some challenges in it. And I've had to do a lot of sorting in terms of gray zone and talent time in order to get this new offering, um, which is going to be coming out soon, the online deep apprenticeship, Hypnosis Without Trance. So it's a new, new content creation game for me. So George is saying, George, uh, who I know and is a generally solid chap, is asking, this may be a little woo-woo. Do you put any value in defining your goals, write them down, reread them to yourself often? Yes, I do. Yes. Absolutely, 100%. So I don't think it's that woo-woo at all. So far as I'm concerned, your focus creates your reality, right? So either I choose my focus or it ends up choosing me. I want to bring my attention back continually to what it is that I'm looking to create, but not just like, you know, having it come alive. I want my enthusiasm and my inspiration to come alive. This is part of my business game, is managing my focus and managing my enthusiasm so I connect into enthusiasm. And that's the place that I'm coming from and creating from all the time. So I do a lot of work on that. Uh, I'm just looking for my big, I have a big A4 book with a very fancy golden cover. It's over there. I'm not going to jump up and get it. Uh, and inside of that, I do a lot of um self-coaching self-transformation work and stuff around staying focused on what it is that i'm creating and connecting into the value in that and the inspiration that that evokes within me because that is the place that i'm going to most powerfully create from it's going to keep me moving forward and rising up rather than laying low and hanging back so that's a hugely important thing um yes the webinar will be available for replay eric um so eric's got clients uh, I would love to learn how to connect with people who are inspired, says Lisa, but I don't fully know how. Okay, so um, you do that by, one of the easiest ways to do that is online. Look, this is going to tie in with another point, actually. So um, point three was engage. I've done my hour. I'm going to have to go over a little bit. Point three was engage uh, with the business. So engage with it. Get in the game, stay in the game, learn, grow, and attack. Um, point five is connect with generative people. I'm going to go back to point four in a minute. I should have just changed the order. 
So if you want to connect with people who are coming from a place of inspiration, what you want to do is find their watering holes. Where do they hang out online? There's going to be some Facebook groups. There used to be forums. Forums used to be a big thing. Um, one of the things that you can do now, now I've just said that this is a game that I'm just moving into, is Facebook ads. So Facebook ads are wonderful because they are highly targetable. They are highly targetable. You can find something very specific that somebody is into and you can target advertising, i.e. messages to those people. So for example, uh, if you were looking for people who were into the law of attraction, for example, they self-identify on Facebook. They're kind of easy to find. The other thing to do is find clubs and groups and this sort of thing. Now, this is, this is to do with, um, I put this on my point to do with finding a peer group for yourself. This is a more of a question, I think, about finding potential customers to connect with. But really, it's a matter of finding people who resonate with what you're into. If you're geographically bound, that is more challenging to do. It's much easier to open up as a hypnotherapist in a small town than it is to open up as a coach in a small town. Why? Because pain is prevalent. Okay, desperation is prevalent. Inspiration is not. It is small. So if you want, if that's a market you want to connect with, um, inspirational market, you're probably going to have to go and you live in a small town, you're going to have to go beyond that. If you live in a city, it's kind of easier. You still want to find the other. Start looking at Facebook groups. Where can you show up? Who can you engage with via Facebook groups? If you find a Facebook group which is engaged in a particularly positive, forward-thinking philosophy, for example, you can go out, you can hang out there. This is the principle of go to the watering holes of your customers. The people you want to connect with, there are watering holes out there. There are places to do it. You can do it in the real world, more easy if you live in big cities. You can do it uh, online. You've got Facebook targeting, you've got Facebook groups anyway. You can show up inside of Facebook groups. If you want to show up inside of the group and contribute, answer questions, start to become an authority inside of the group to some degree, that's one way that you can do that. So there are a number of options around that. Um, so it seems, James is saying, it seems what hypnotists slash therapists are actually selling is effective problem solving skills. How do you promote your difference in this? How So how you promote your difference in this area is important. This is a huge thing, James. There's a concept, which I shall mention briefly, called fungibility from economics. Now, something is fungible, like a, a dollar bill is fungible. And what that means is if I lend you a dollar bill, and you give it back to me next week and you give me a different dollar bill with a different serial number on, it doesn't matter. Dollar bill is a dollar bill. There's no difference between them. If I lend you um, a 10, you know, 10 pound bag of coal or of charcoal, of lumpwood charcoal, and you give me a different 10 pound bag of lumpwood charcoal back, that's fine. Okay, so those things are entirely kind of fungible. Um, if I lend you my, if I give you my Mona Lisa and you give me a Jack Vetriano print back next week, I'm going to be upset with you because these things are non-fungible. The Jack Vetriano original even does not equate in value to the, um, the Mona Lisa. So they're non-fungible. Now, one of the big mistakes that people make as practitioners is they make themselves fungible. This is one of the problems with copying other people's websites and this sort of thing and looking for inspiration in what other people are doing. You're just becoming another one of them and you make yourself, um, you make yourself entirely fungible. Now, if you're fungible, the only thing that you've got to trade upon is being the cheapest or the most convenient. And these are cruddy things to trade upon. So what you want to do is start to connect to your uniqueness. And one of the ways you define your uniqueness is through your communications with the world. People will resonate with how you communicate. That's what's going to mark you out. Somebody was saying to me earlier on today about personal branding. And I was saying, I'm just not into personal branding. I may, I'm not into personal niching. I don't want to niche myself. I don't want to brand myself. I may want to brand and niche offerings, but I do not want to do that for myself. I want my creations to define me. I want my communications to define me. Ultimately, if I have difference-making conversations out there in the world, 
I will be the only person having those conversations in that way. I will reach the people that I reach because that's how I reach them. Um, many years ago, I had somebody come to me for a specific type of coaching that is specialized in by other coaches. And those other coaches I should name in this instance are Jamie Smart and Michael Neal. I had somebody who had been on Michael Neal's um, super coach program, I think it was called, and also on Jamie Smart's clarity program. And then they came to me for more of the same. And I said, why are you coming to me? Those guys are the, the specialists in this. He said, yeah, but there's something about how you communicate things. So he was coming to me for a particular reason, for a particular take, for a particular angle. You end up creating yourself through the conversations you're having with the world, not through some abstract contrivance, but you will create yourself as unique. And it's absolutely imperative that you lean into that uniqueness because otherwise you're just another fungible hypnotherapist slash coach slash whatever who's got nothing to trade on but being the cheapest and most conveniently placed geographically. So yes, you wanna make yourself non-fungible. Um, so Angela's asking, enthusiasm building tips? Yes, I do have plenty. Um, and I'm also watching the time, so I'm gonna keep that one out of here. But it's to do with connecting with what excites you, starting to learn about who you are, becoming a better, uh, know thyself. What switches you on, what excites you? Also. Model your own enthusiasm. I'm a big modeler, right? So what I call high vibration states, when I'm in a high vibration state, I modeled that to see how it was built, what was present, what was not. So I'm good at hacking myself into those as well. But that's a whole um, thing in and of itself. So I'm, I'm slightly reluctant to go too far down that at this point. Carlos is saying, any tips, exercises on how to learn to distinguish uh, when there's too much thinking, and just stop strategizing and thinking and taking action. So far as I'm concerned, always be taking action. Always be taking action. This is part of my point about engaging. Get in the game, stay in the game. Okay, so for me, I have a bias towards what I call nonlinear generative engagement. I will prioritize action above all else. If I spend a long time in a stale planning strategizing zone, it's not going to work for me. So I want to get out there and start making differences. Time spent with income producing activities is the only way to increase your income. So get involved in activities now. Do something now. Make a message now. Create a message now. This webinar, by the way, I didn't strategize about doing this. I spontaneously decided to do this moments before I announced it. I did not hang around plotting and planning the webinar. I just put the webinar out. I took action. 50 people on this webinar there's more people on the live stream so i could have hung around planning it forever i could just get out there and engage in a conversation with you good people so action is absolutely paramount do not hang out one thing that you have as an independent practitioner is agility like this is a massive edge over bigger organizations you have agility the ability to act now the ability to maneuver the ability to create right now in this moment with what's coming up I would massively endorse that. And by the way, when I'm coaching, I coach from my biases. So I coach much more from that place than from a, well, let's just sit here in some abstract headspace trying to get everything right before we release something to the world. Doesn't tend to work out so well in my biased opinion. So Willem is saying, uh, have to go, thank you. Okay, yeah. Um, Jan's saying, we don't mind you going over. Antonio, thank you, Jan. Antonio, yes, it is being recorded. Uh, Richard says, doesn't feel good driving in pain either. Um, how do you suggest going into a person's criteria, outcome of outcomes, uh, more money, more opportunity, opportunity for my kids, feel like I'm here, feel like I'm the hero to my family. Here's the thing, I had a mentor once, um, he said to me, uh, he said, you know, I know your deepest fears. And I'm like, well, you know, we've only just met at this point. He said, I know, um, he said, I know that what you really fear, the thing that you've never even told your closest friends is that you've spent all this money on this training, 
that you've got these skills, you've got these expertise, but you're going to end up staying at home looking after the kids while your wife goes out and makes all the money. Now, that was, it was a deep secret fear and it was very specific. And I was blown away. It was like, he just read my mind. I said, whoa, that's spooky stuff. He said, it's not spooky stuff. He said, you are my demographic, so I know you. And I marketed specifically to that indirectly. So here's one of the things. A lot of the time people are trying to assess client needs, the deep psychology of the people they want to work with in abstract. Just get to know people. Start knowing people. Start having conversations with people. Dig deeper. Ask. Read between the lines. Through many, 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 many conversations, you will build a picture of the people you want to help. You will come to know them more fully, more deeply. And it will make it easier and easier for you to communicate with what they really want deep down underneath everything else. So instead of coming up with some kind of interview format that says, if you do this, you ask these questions, you're going to get these values. That's quite superficial. Really get to know people. Get to know the clients. Whenever I run a workshop, I am constantly listening to where people are speaking from in order to map out their model of the world. This is much more important than any kind of, kind of turnkey um, thing. In the simplest way, just get to know people. Listen, really listen. Particularly when you start to be able to listen to structures and what is presupposed by those structures, which is part of how I do coaching, um, that becomes a useful skill to develop as well. Uh, so James says, did you model any particular hypnotist therapist to improve your business head game? Um, no, no, I didn't model any, but I've asked a lot of questions about how people do what they do. Um, initially the, the main game changer came for me from mentors more specifically, who were not necessarily mentors, who were therapists also, but they were mentors in um, practitioner business skills in a slightly broader sense. So that was that was a huge thing for me. But I am, you know, I have a lot of good friends who are making things work uh, out there in the world. Um, Mike Mandel, Chris Thompson, Melissa Tears, uh, Yogan Rasmussen, Anthony Jackwin, Freddie Jackwin. I could I could continue. I could go on and on and on. And they all run different businesses in different ways. But I'm always curious as to how they're doing what they're doing so we can get a sense of that. Um, and I'm always putting information in, sucking information in. So that's actually point four on my list is get transformative input uh, from mentors and from coaches who are specialists in the areas that you're looking at. Uh, and from books as well, and from every source that you can. Now, at this point, transformative information, okay? Not just information, you go, well, that's food for thought. I mean, really consider the messages. Take bits, try bits out. It's only when you allow something to change the way you're doing things, change the way you're seeing things, it becomes transformative. So you've got to be in the game, engaging, in order for information to be transformative. Like you could read books on swimming technique and that could up your swimming game, provided you were swimming regularly. But if you're reading the books in abstract and never getting in the pool, it doesn't make any difference. So you do want to get input from uh, books, from coaches, from mentors. And they may be formal mentors, they may be informal mentors. Um, so yes, I'm always looking at how is that person doing that? How are they solving that problem? What's their approach to this? How do they do that bit? Oh, they're doing this thing, which I've never done. I wonder how that's working for them. How specifically are they doing it? What are the key skills that you need in order to be able to run that aspect of this game? So I'm constantly curious because I'm constantly looking to up my game. Ultimately, all of this stuff comes down to knacks, a collection of knacks. When you have the knacks, the understandings, you can make stuff happen. Um, so Lisa's saying, I think I could benefit by having a coach. Um, yes, probably, and it depends on the coach, and it's a good coach. Nobody needs coaching, okay? Nobody needs coaching. It is hugely significant in accelerating your learning curve. I think it, it shows, if you look at where coaching comes from, it comes from the world of performance arts, it comes from the world of sports. You find me, an Olympic medalist, who has not got a coach. 
you won't find one. Now, there's a reason for that. If people could be become as effective as they could be without a coach, then you would see people who are Olympic medalists who don't have coaches. But all of them who are dedicated to really, you know, if it's 100 meters sprint, that's the game. They're dedicated to taking it to the highest level. They will get a coach, unquestionably. Now, you don't need a coach in life, but ultimately, if you want to accelerate your development, um, a good coach is going to be a huge asset. And you're unlikely to reach the top of your game without one. This is probably fair to say. Um, or certainly not without good mentors as well, a good input, good peers. I have a very strong peer group, which is one of the points on my list as well. Um, point five was connect with generative people who have horizons, who are looking to solve the same kinds of problems as you, who are looking to take their life in similar directions to build a peer group as well. So mentors, coaches on the one hand are important, peers who are looking to similar horizons is essential as well. Um, so uh, Eric is saying, Eric is saying here, uh, too many of us are unconsciously incompetent when we start out. This is absolutely true. Um, I spend a lot of time in Santa Monica, spend the summers in Santa Monica often, and I hang around on the traveling rings there. I love doing the traveling rings. If you look on my Facebook header, you'll see me doing the traveling rings there. A lot of the time people will sidle up and they will go to have a go at that. And they grab hold of it with sort of two hands. You can instantly see they have no clue what they're doing, but they also have no clue that they have no clue. And I'll flail about in the rings for a bit and then often come up with an excuse as to why they can't do it. I heard a guy this summer saying, my arms are too short. He had perfectly normal arms, but he was absolutely sure because he got up, flailed around on the rings, couldn't do it. He was sure that his arms were too short. But the point was, is there was something he didn't know. Well, there's a lot of things he didn't know, but he didn't know that he didn't know them. He thought he should just be able to do it. He didn't realize there was sort of craft to it. There was a knack to it. There was hidden understandings that underpin being able to do the traveling rings that he was missing. So you get a lot of people that do that there. And sometimes you'll get somebody wanders up and they'll say, somebody did this this summer. So what's the trick then? And when they wander up and say, so what's the trick then? I'm able to go, well, come along. First of all, take hold of the rings. What you want to do is start just by hanging and then start to swing your waist. Get most of the momentum from the body. It's not about the arms at the moment. Then I can coach them. And those people rapidly go, all oh, right. Now, actually, it's not because I'm the greatest guy on the rings in the world, but I just happen to know some of the fundamentals of what needs to happen there. So I can point it out and I can rapidly shorten their game. Now, some of those people, if they didn't quit, if they carried on trying to do the rings, they might get there eventually without any input and without any assistance. But certainly those who recognize there's something to know that they don't know yet, and they ask somebody who's perhaps done it a bit before, it helps out. And that's pretty obvious that's going to be the case. I'm also aware that I don't want to be on here trying to tell anybody they need a coach or anything like that. I'm aware I said this was sponsored by the 2020 Prosperous Practitioner Crucible, which I'm running, is a small group coaching thing. I love running these. There are, there are a couple of people on here who have been on my last group, which was called Power of 8 2.0, before I got a cease and desist on using that name from uh, somebody called Lynn McTaggart. So I'm doing things differently, and it's given me the opportunity to evolve the group as well. So I know there are people who have, have done the coaching group uh, with me before who are on this call. And, um, and I'm really looking forward to shaping this one up because I've got some new perspectives on how I wanna be taking this one forward. But the aim of this is I want for people inside of it, and I only want people inside of it who are serious about really upping their game in terms of wealth creation through leveraging their expertise as a practitioner. They may be new, they may already be established, but it's about challenging themselves to go somewhere they have not gone yet. And I don't mean pushing or driving or gritting or grinding through. I'm talking about growing, becoming more than you were, understanding more deeply, transforming yourself and your capability and your capacity. So perhaps where you were laying low before, you are now rising up, being able to identify your developmental edges and enjoying leaning into them and transforming them. 
This is what I'm talking about here. Uh, and that work ranges from deep uh, rewiring of worldview on the one level, all the way down to simple tactical and strategic stuff. Sometimes there are very, very simple maneuvers, you know, like Lisa was saying, she loves the hairdressing maneuver. And I mentioned on the page that I once shared, must have taken 30 seconds to share an idea that tripled somebody's income in one go. It's a very simple idea. It was sell blocks of three sessions rather than one session, right? It's a simple idea. It's like most people are out there selling their time by the session instead of selling their time, time in different ways. Okay, so even a simple maneuver, I'm not saying that's the be all and end all, but something simple like that can often increase somebody's income uh, hugely overnight. So um, that group's running. You'll see some, some stuff around there. Uh, Angela Brooks, thank you, Angela. She's saying, I was on it and loved it. So thank you, Angela. And I loved having you in the group as well. Uh, the, the point about the, the, the groups that I run, yes, I am present as a facilitator, as a coach, my perspective is there. I do some facilitation sometimes as well. But really it's the generativity of getting a group of people who are going, do you know what, we're making something happen. We're headed in a different direction. It's raising your eyes to a horizon. There is a generative energy within the group, which is absolutely fantastic. The problem with not having peers around you who are looking to raise their eyes to a different horizon. I'll just tell this story very quickly. I have a client at the moment um, who is in the US, who lives in the US, she lives in the US, but she uh, comes from the UK. And she went back to the UK recently for about a month, I think, and met up with old friends. And she was telling her old friends from the UK that she is building an international coaching business. That's her intention. That's what she wishes to do. And her friends kind of laughed at her and said, oh, come on, you're not in California anymore. This is the real world. Because so far as them, as far as they're concerned, that vision is not realistic. So if you're hanging around with people who believe that what you hold as vision is not realistic, that they are caught up in the idea of grinding through, uh, sacrificial work, time for money, earning money, no leverage in their life, they think they see the world as it is, and they're going to try and pull your eyes down all the time because they want you to be realistic. So I have some old friends who are really good friends. I absolutely love them to bits. I, I spend minimal time with them. I go to see them, catch up with things. Don't talk about business. Don't talk about what I'm doing there because they can't get it. So they either have to be oh, blown away and confused and we're going to have a lack of rapport going on or they're going to try and bring me back down to their level. So it's really important to get um, to get uh, a peer group that works for you as well. All right, I'm going to wrap this up now. I hope there's been value in this for people who are listening to it. I will find a place to put this recording up. I'm having people saying, hey, could you send me a, a, an email? I will find a place to put the recording up, maybe on YouTube is the best place. Um, so Helen says, always love learning from and with people who are drawn to you, James, thank you for today. Thank you, Helen. Uh, good that you could be on here. Um, and thank everybody here as well. I'm going to end this call now. If you want to get on the uh, Prosperous Practitioner Crucible, if that's an interesting thing to you, it is an application thing. I want to make sure everybody in the group is really aligned. Um, but I'll put a link around here somewhere where you can find out about this. Any further questions off the back of it? Ask them somewhere, YouTube, Facebook, ask them, and I will mop them up with additional audios or videos. Thank you all for being here and have a fantastic evening or rest of the day. Okay, so if you like this video, make sure you hit thumbs up, like the video. If you are looking for more rare knowledge on using your mind to shape your life, or you're looking to help people use their minds to shape their lives, and you're looking at how you can establish yourself that way, then please do hit subscribe, please do hit the notifications bell, and please do use the comment section below to ask questions, share feedback, and that way this conversation can continue.